Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal education content. And today will be the day I earn that subscription. For today's story, we are learning a little bit about originalism. Because of a recent op-ed that was entitled, The Supreme Court's 2022 Originalism is White Supremacy. Well, you've got my attention right up because originalism is something that I believe in. So let's discuss what originalism is. All right, originalism is a legal is a legal interpretation theory, right? We wanna figure out what the law is. We need to be able to read the text and be able to understand what it means. So how do we go about doing that? Well, there are a lot of different ways we could go about doing it. And originalism is one of those ways. And what originalism says is when the legislature writes a law, they write the law using words. Those words have particular meanings at the time they are written. Those meanings are fixed at the time they are written. The words on the page mean what they mean at the time they are written. They don't change based on future understandings of the changes of words. Words mean what they mean when they're written down. The words don't change, the meanings don't change, they are fixed on the page. This seems perfectly logical. When the legislature is passing a law today, they are going to have debates over various choices of language. Those choices of language are going to be ultimately reflected on the page. Those choices should be respected because the legislative process is the process by which those words get chosen. When a court is trying to interpret what the statute means, they need to interpret it based on the words that Congress chose or the legislature chose because they could have chosen different words, but they chose those words, presumably out of some sort of debate process by which those words got selected. And they had particular meanings in mind, or the words had particular meanings when they were written down. And it's not up to the judiciary to change those meanings, rather than to faithfully apply what Congress wrote. This is originalism at its core. This does not change whether the law was passed yesterday or a thousand years ago. If the law needs to be updated, there is a mechanism for updating it, right? There is a process to updating and changing the law, but the judiciary isn't meant to change the law. It's meant to interpret the law and you interpret that by its original meanings. This is originalism at its core. To me, this is fundamentally correct. Well, someone has a problem with this, namely Bar Barnyard Woods, who has authored Inheritance an autobiography of whiteness. Wow. I can tell right away we're on, we're in for a good time. An autobiography of whiteness, which implies if she is the, if they are the author, uh, I, I would just like to take note that if we parse the words literally, which is also a good thing to do in originalism, if it's an autobiography of whiteness, that must mean that Barnyard Woods is whiteness because it's an autobiography that they wrote. So they are whiteness. Well, there's that. So that's, that's interesting right away. Let's read this op-ed, which I'm sure will be just illuminating more. Okay. Even as the first black woman to sit on the Supreme Court was sworn, sworn in, the slate of rulings from the newly empowered right wing an originalist court majority this term has made it clearer than ever. The court is motivated by reliance on the white supremacist patriarchy of the Constitution's framers. Well, we are definitely not trying to neutrally frame this in any way, right? Originalist majority, yes, we are trying to interpret the Constitution or the statute or the treaty or whatever based on the words that were used. Law is words. Words are the craft of law. Words have meanings. When you are choosing what to write down in a contract or in a deed or in a will or in a law, a statute, a regulation, a treaty, a constitution, right? You use words. That is the tool of law is words. And you choose different words because you want different words because those words are the best words. At least it seems because they're the words that you chose. And, you know, they're the words we're going to use to understand it because they're the words you picked. But apparently doing this is not motivated over giving the words 
their original meaning. It's not meant over, it's not based on words having definitions and actually applying definitions of words. It is instead reliance on white supremacist patriarchy. Excellent. Let's read more about this wonderful state of affairs. With Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, which overturned Roe versus Wade, and New York State versus and Pistol Rifle Association versus Bruin, the court has signaled the desire to make America great again. Uh, they didn't use those words in any decision, I'm quite sure. Using 18th and 19th century standards to address modern problems. Well, not exactly 18th and 19th century standards. That's not quite right. Using 18th and 19th century laws because those are the laws that apply. Laws don't automatically expire. Laws expire when they're, well, the law themselves can say they expire, which sometimes happens. You have sunset clauses. So sometimes laws expire because the law itself says it expires or it otherwise expires when it's changed. The process of a law getting changed is creating a new law. How do you do that? Well, I'm just a bill. I'm only a bill. Sitting here on Capitol Hill, well, I'm, you know, that, you know, that's what you do, right? You create a law, and then if you don't like that law, you create a different law using the processes for creating laws as set out in the Constitution. So it's not exactly the standards as it is the laws that they wrote. In the case of the Constitution, those laws have been around for a long time, but that was the point of the Constitution. The entire point was to fix certain laws as being so important, so fundamental, that we wanted to imbue them with an extra gravitas to make them more long lasting. And if they need to be changed, they can be changed. The process is meant to be deliberately hard because they're meant to be something that persists. Thus, the nature of what a Constitution is. If, if you don't think there should be a constitution and we should just do everything by legislation, then okay. But then, you know, don't really have any principles beyond whatever the legislature thinks is good right now, which is a way to live, to be sure. But, you know, leaves yourself open to the political whims of the moment and doesn't let you have anything that's truly imbued in anything that is solidified. So, I, I, I okay. All right. Specifically, these rulings rely heavily on a judicial philosophy called originalism, which argues that in interpreting the Constitution, we must hold intent the thought process of the framers above all else. This is, this is not correct. The, the intent is not the right way of phrasing originalism. There are multiple different ways of interpreting a statute, by the way. Um, there is the text of the statute, the literal words on the page, the history, how it came about, might tell you something about what it means. Intent, what did they have in mind? The, uh, the policy behind it, what were they trying to do? The precedent, what, what was happening in sort of legal um, cases that might inform, like if the Congress is passing a law, it might be because they're not happy with judicial decisions. So the precedent of cases might be relevant to understand the statute. And also there's those, so those are basically your constructs. Uh, originalism tends to lean first and foremost on text, the words on the page, not intent. The intent behind things is more of a left-wing philosophy rather than a right-wing philosophy of interpretation, right? More left-wing philosophies are policy Policy is more of a left-wing interpretation. Intent is more of a left-wing interpretation. This isn't to say that the right wing doesn't use these tools. It's just not their first tools, right? There's a hierarchy of these tools, if you like. So the left wing tends to use policy and intent first, and then other things. Originalism is using the text first, and the history first. And the, and, the, and the precedent first, and that kind of stuff, things, right? And then if you're a textualist, like Gorsuch, then the text becomes even more important because what you care about is the words on the page rather than some sort of meaning or intent behind it. 
So there's, you know, they there's we're not off to a great start of defining what originalism is. Originalism is again trying to understand what the words mean on the page. So starting with the words is kind of where an originalist originalist is going to start. And if you're a textualist, more likely to stop. If you're originalist, you'll look to other things to help inform it. And then it just becomes a question of how deep you want to go. And then you get into the nuances of different flavors or different applications of originalism. But I digress. That's too much, too much nuance for this article. Originalist judges express a belief we should interpret the U.S. Constitution according to the legal opinions of the 18th century white men. According to the words they wrote down on the page, yes, because the Constitution says the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and so it's the supreme law of the land. And so a judge, in interpreting the Constitution, is interpreting it as having a primacy. For me, at least, interpreting the Constitution is not really fundamentally different than interpreting a statute or a regulation or anything else. It's just an issue of primacy. It's an issue of hierarchy. What comes first, right? If you put a statute in front of me and you put the Constitution in front of me, I'm going to use the same exact tools to interpret both these things. There's no difference for me in interpreting the Constitution versus a statute, versus a regulation, versus a contract, versus a will, versus a treaty, versus a anything else, right? It's the same tools every single time. In the event of conflicts between these things, then we have to decide which of these things has primacy, which beats wheat, which, right? If there's a conflict between a regulation and a statute, which should win, right? We have to have a rule for that. And so the rule for the Constitution is pretty simple because it says it's the supreme law of the land. So it says, well, whatever else is true, the Constitution necessarily comes first. So in the event of a conflict between the Constitution and anything else, the Constitution wins because it comes first, because it's the supreme law of the land. This is not based on the legal opinions of the people in the 18th century it's so much as the words they picked which have meaning and it's best to understand words with meaning. For example, this article I'm reading right now are words on a page. These words were chosen by its author for a particular reasons. The author could have chosen other words. The author chose these words in understanding this article. Therefore, it is appropriate for me to understand the article based on the words the author chose because they chose those words. Now, since they wrote the article today, for all intents and purposes, it might have been last week, but you know, there's no different. The English language hasn't exactly moved a lot in the last week. I don't have to deal a lot with trying to figure out what the words mean because they kind of mean the same thing they would mean if they were written today. But improperly interpreting their argument I have to start with the words they picked. I assume they would like that as an author because they presumably spent some time writing the article and editing the article and making sure their word choice was everything they hoped it for. And so I'm honoring them as an author by reading their words and actually using the words they wrote. It's the exact same thing when it comes to the Constitution. Reading this article is no different than reading the Constitution. Let's start with the words on the page. Sounds like a really good idea. Continuing on. But I would submit the reason that such judicial view is not only possible, but predominant among our highest jurists is because so few of us white men and increasingly white women have been willing over the last centuries to question our inheritance of historic American privilege. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and then they say originalism is patriarchal white supremacy. I, I don't really know what you're talking about. The, the, the Constitution certainly had its flaws. Uh, many of those flaws have been ironed out for the better. The, the law basically today recognizes everyone as equal. I don't really know what law there is that is creating patriarchy. 
but okay. Um, and even if it did, the right solution would be to amend the law. Because if we think the law is bad, then we should go through the process of changing the law. We shouldn't just ignore it because then a judge is substituting their subjective judgment for that of the legislature. They're acting as, a, as they're acting as a legislature at that point. So there's, you know, there's a process and we should follow the process. If you want to change the process itself, that's fine. Follow the process to change the process. It's like, you know, I, I don't, yeah, okay, I'm carrying on. The debates surrounding the framing of the Constitution reveal fraught compromises. Oh, yeah. Between rich white men balancing the interests of states with the interests of the union. Yeah. The delegates from my home state of South Carolina, for example, use tortured self-serving rationale to justify their continued importation of enslaved people from Africa. If slavery be wrong, it is justified by example of all the world, said Charles Pickney, revolutionary war hero and member of the South Carolina delegation of the convention and slaveholder, said per a New York Times account. Any attempt to take away the right as proposed will produce serious objections to the constitution. Yes, slavery was recognized by the Constitution. This was not a good thing. Fortunately, the Constitution was amended to take it away. It was amended through a very long and very painful and very bloody process, incidentally, but amended for the better. And he, he kind of has, I guess, a partial point where he says slavery is, is be wrong. It's justified by the examples of the world because slavery is the experience of the world through any sort of any sort of honest account of world history. Slavery is by far and away the norm of the world. The, the idea of slavery is bad is a very modern conception in the scope of the entire history of the world. So, I mean, there's something to be said there. That being the case, however, we can now say it's bad and amend it out and the world was just wrong, which it was because it didn't value the individual autonomy and individual locus of individual human experience. The idea that people have value as individuals, like as that they have value is also a somewhat modern invention rooting itself in the enlightenment, for example, the idea that people have worth is a novel idea in world history. So the constitution had its flaws to be sure. It was the best thinking of its time. So even at the time of the constitution, slavery was still practiced in much of the world. Not all the world, of course, to be fair. I mean, other parts of the world have moved on, so I'm not trying to claim otherwise but it was a flaw, but it was fixed. We got rid of it. And it's for the best. So I don't know what the problem is because we, we, we corrected that issue. This is a good thing. The framers ultimately reached a compromise where the importation of enslaved people would face a sunset clause, but would not be immediately outlawed. Yes. And thus the domestic trade in enslaved people and the political empowerment of those who enslaved them was enshrined in the nation's founding document. Yes, it was. It was a flaw in the founding document. No one, including the founders themselves, thought the Constitution was flawless. And I'm not going to sit here and argue with you that the Constitution as it currently exists is flawless. You know, if I were king, I can think of some amendments that I'd like to make you know, vis-a-vis -vis, um, political gerrymandering, for example, and voting methodology that I think would be beneficial to the United States. But, you know, for better or worse, I'm not king. There is a process to go through to change these things. And the process is meant to make sure that when, when you make these changes, we've thought them all the way through and are truly willing to commit them as enshrined principles in our most foundational law. So that would be good. My family traced some genealogical connection to Pickney and taught me to be proud. I descended from someone at the Constitutional Convention. But when I see his words, I feel nothing but shame and revulsion. 
I think it is a, I mean, I won't tell you how to feel yourself. I will say that I think in general, it's a bit of a mistake to hold the people at the time to modern standards because, or to the perfection of modern standards. I mean, George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or, you know, the people of the time had many flaws. And for several of them, slavery was an issue that we could look back to, but they were still great men who did great things despite their flaws. I think it's a bit of a mistake to say, well, you know, they were making these huge, mis the, what we consider to be huge mistakes from a modern perspective. You know, I think we re should recognize them as great men for the great things that they did. And I can't speak to Pickney or how you should feel about them in particular, but, you know, it was part of a process and compromise that brought together a nation which has had its troubles and reform, but it's like, you know, yeah. Originalists feel no, feel no such shame. When the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, we no longer had to consider what the framer said about the issue, the originalists argue, because the amendment superseded the original intent. Again, original intent isn't quite the right way of phrasing this. Superseded the original law is better. That's the point of the amendment. The, the amendment amended the Constitution. So it's not so much that it superseded the original intent as it superseded the original law. Thus, thus we have an amendment. So, right, we no longer have to consider what the framers said originally because now what they said originally is no longer operative. What's operative is the 13th Amendment, which to the degree, if any, it should be changed is the right point of the focus of the discussion, along with any other provision of the Constitution that is currently operative. But it's impossible to sever a man like Pickney's thoughts on slavery from the rest of his worldview. Why? Why is that impossible? Especially someone who grew up in a place like Charleston, a one-time heart of the nation's slave trade, and on a plantation surrounded by people over whose his family exacted absolute control in order to extract absolute value. Again, there, there are many, many sins. It has been said that more people emigrated through Charleston than through Ellis Island. The, the difference being, of course, the people who emigrated through Charleston weren't voluntary. It is a disturbing part of American history. But we fixed that and we improved our country as a result. So, I mean, yeah. But it's impossible to sever a man like Pickney's thoughts on slavery from the rest of his worldview. I don't know why. Just because he was wrong about something doesn't mean he was wrong about everything. I'm sure elements of his worldview still have merit, just like other people at the time. They're, they're, to suggest that nothing they thought of had merit is ridiculous. There were a lot of principles in there that seemed quite prudent and quite correct to me. Even we allow that the Constitution was eventually amended to undo Pickney's monstrous beliefs about who was human, or at least who had personhood, but more properly. It's hard to trust any argument that relies on his or her contemporary's intent. Again, intent is not the right phraseology. The right phraseology is the words, the originalist words, the words on the page. What do they mean? Laws have meanings because they use words, just like your article uses words. Just like me talking to camera, I'm using words. The words have meanings. I may not be speaking precisely. I may be speaking inaccurately. I might not be expressing my thoughts completely, but they are the words I've chosen. And if they need to be corrected, then, you know, there can always be a corrected video, for example, but to better express my thoughts or revise my thoughts or whatever, but we can only understand things based on the words that are chosen. It would be improper for people to read into what I'm saying beyond the words that I'm using because I'm making certain choices, trying to express certain thoughts hopefully getting them thought across correctly, but if not, there's a process for fixing that too. 
Though Justice Clarence Thomas is also descended from those enslaved by the founders, he's long been one of the court's most staunch originalists. Yes, because he's doing his job. The, he has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. He's doing his job. Though now following President Donald Trump's appointee, he has a lot more competition. And some of that competition is for the best, incidentally, because... I think that Justice Gorsuch's textualism has quite a lot of appeal. Also, I have definitely disagreed from Justice Thomas from time to time because um, because I don't think he follows his own principles all the way through sometimes. Tim West says, by Kurt's logic, we should only read the words of the Founding Fathers, but ignore what they actually did. When it comes to interpretation of law, yes. You're correct. We should only read the laws that they passed. Correct. The, we should only read the words of the laws they passed. Correct. We should ignore what they did. Correct. This is, this is right. When we're interpreting a law, we have to interpret it based on the words of the law. Their own behavior is not relevant in trying to determine what the words mean. Their behavior may or may not be consistent with the words, but what matters are the words, not their behavior. So yes, we should ignore their behavior. We should instead only use the words on the page because they wrote a law and we're doing legal interpretation. So the correct thing for us to do is to look at the words that they wrote on the page and what those, what those meant at the time. That's the right legal interpretation. If that legal interpretation is not to our desire, then we amend that. But yes, we look to the words on the page correctly, correct. That and only that, this is, this is right. This is quite right. And you said, I didn't read the end where you said own slaves. It didn't matter to the analysis either way, Tim. So yes, what they did own slaves, you're right. We should ignore the fact they own slaves. Correct. We're trying to interpret what the law means. What matters is the words on the page. Their behavior and owning slaves or otherwise is irrelevant to the proper interpretation of the law. Uh, okay. You're, you're welcome, Tim, I guess. Um, in the court's ruling on Dobbs, the majority highlighted its original spent saying a woman's right to abortion was not protected because it was not deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. This seems to be right. Fine. Of course, there were no women in the Constitutional Convention or other powers of position at the time. That does not mean there were no abortions. No one's saying that there weren't any abortions. We're saying that they weren't deeply rooted in the American history, history and tradition. It wasn't something that was recognized in history and tradition as a right. I mean, that's at least the idea. Yes. But in his concordance, concordance, I guess, Thomas took this rationale further, seeing the need to correct other precedent that strayed from the intent of the framers. Again, intent is the wrong phraseology. Thomas argues that rights were unenumerated in the Constitution are not necessarily legitimate, right? Specifically taming a, taking aim at the principle of substantive due process. Yes, which is a bedrock of decisions protecting same-sex marriage and contraception. S to some degree, that's true. To some degree, not. Like, the, the degree to which it's a bedrock of those is, is, is an issue or not. But yes, Thomas does not believe in substantive due process because the Constitution does not support it. Now, I'm not sure how much it really matters because Article 1 or Section 1 of the 14th Amendment talks about privileges or immunities, which seems to me gets you pretty much everywhere that you get now. But Thomas is right in talking about the idea of substantive due process is not really incorporated or not really mentioned in the text. And it's also inconsistent with the text. So, yeah, Thomas would like to re-examine the legal underpinnings of quite a lot of Supreme Court precedent, but he does have a point that it would be more intellectually correct or more legally pure because it would be more in line with the text. So, yeah. Mm. 
gun restrictions, meanwhile, and the racism that informs them. Yes, gun restrictions have some deep racist roots. This is very true. Predate the United States of America. South Carolina's so-called slave codes, which were exported to most other slave states after 1740, not only prohibited Africans from carrying weapons, but also required white men to carry a gun in some situations in public in order to be ready to quell any insurrection of enslaved people. Incidentally, slaves made up a majority of the population in low country areas near Charleston, including the Georgia Sea Islands where Clarence Thomas was raised just over the border. Centuries later, Ronald Reagan and the National Rifle Association were only too happy to support gun restrictions when they hoped to disarm the Panther Party. Yes, these were wrong. These were wrong. Now, gun restrictions in 1740 on the basis of race are obviated by the 13th Amendment, which prohibits not only slavery, but badges and incidents to slavery. So it prohibits racial discrimination in a more broad sense. So yes, it is quite true that gun control historically was racist. And even after the passage of the 13th Amendment in the Jim Crow era, the nature of why gun restrictions were passed was often racist to suppress black ownership of guns. Uh, the concealed carry laws and gun ownership laws have very racist origins in a lot of the country. So yes, this is quite correct. This makes them largely bad for that reason. Also because they defy the text of the Second Amendment and they defy equal protection and they defy the, the badges and instances of slavery provisions. So yeah. Okay. In our fractured moment, we might be able to salvage the Constitution, but only if we separate the document from the poisonous ideas of many who framed it. I don't even know what that means. Defaulting to an original op uh, uh, interpretation will do the opposite. What's the what's the alternative? Just like, what does it mean to salvage the Constitution if not looking at the words that are on the page? Unfortunately, originalism is far from the court's only problem as its decision in West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency made clear, as Justice Elena Kagan pointed out in her dissent, the majority decision in West Virginia versus EPA seems to abandon the textualist basis of original doctrine espoused by Dobbs. Now, I've heard this, but I have not read the EPA decision in, in its entirety, so I can't really speak to this issue, but it has definitely been suggested that the justices might have defied originalist principles in their majority decision in EPA. So we'll have to look into that. I mean, we have to, we're going to have to read it one of these days to find out if that's true. But if it's true that they didn't obey originalism, then that's a bad thing. So we would say they, they betrayed their own principles. The principle is right. The application sucked. The current court is textless only when it's so suits, it, suits it, Kagan wrote. When that method would frustrate broader goals, special canons like the majority question doctrine magically appear as out of text free cards. Okay, so the major's questions doctrine, let's deal with what that is first, all right? So the major, it deals with trying to properly understand what Congress wrote and what they did. It's basically a um, way of ensuring that Congress, when it's delegating certain things, is actually intending to delegate those things. And we think that Congress doesn't hide mountains and molehills. So, Major question doctrine basically said, okay, this it, the idea is, look, if this language on its own terms seems to apply to something, but this something is really, really big, unless it's clear, we're going to assume Congress didn't mean that. Because if Congress meant that, they would have said it with greater clarity. So this happens, for example, the greatest example where this happens is in the residual clauses, whereas in the and other stuff provisions, right? So you'll have a whole lot of text that says a whole lot of things. And then it will say, basically, and other stuff. And when we're interpreting and other stuff, we mean it in the, in the company of the things it keeps. And we're going to disfavor interpretations that would give well more power than Congress seems to delegate. 
So Congress can delegate power, it just has to do so clearly. So in the issue, if text seems to speak to some issue, but we think that, you know, this is just something so major that Congress probably didn't mean the full implications of this, it's like, we want you to be a little bit clearer about this. It's, it's a confirmation of the scope of what they're doing. Because Congress sometimes is a little sloppy in what they write, and we want to make sure that, you know, they're thinking things through a little bit, which is not necessarily the worst concern ever. It's also dealing with making sure that we don't run into the issue of uh, improper delegation or in unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority. So there are some ideas there that are originalist in their nature. They go to fundamental ideas of like separation of powers and other principles, but those principles are also based in the constitutional text. They're just a little bit more subtle, but they're there. So I don't know whether or not those principles were properly applied or not in EPA, but they could have been. So we'll have to get into it some more. The purpose of environmental regulations is to protect those with power from harming all those without it. The court's decision was dovetails with mainstream conservative thought privileges once again so-called freedoms of white patriarchy over all else with particular disdain for regulations designed to protect marginalized communities, or in this case, the planet. Woof. Well, as everyone knows, I have particular disdain for the entire Chevron doctrine, because I think it's improper, but that's a legal disdain. And so the idea that the idea that the Supreme Court is concerned about the growth and perhaps unintentional growth of administrative agencies by Congress's sloppy language is not uh, exactly unbased. You don't need major question. Nosis Ocelis is fine. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, I, I'm not, there's other ways to get there, John. That's certainly true. Yeah. I mean, this is, yeah. Determining the meaning of words is what associated by context. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely true. It's just other principles as well, by the way, uh, to John, uh, this is off topic, but I wanted to address your question from the whole Elon stream because I thought maybe I missed what you're trying to say and I wanted to answer it again. So one of the things that you were talking about was uh, you didn't need fraud in the inducement and you didn't need fraud in fact and you didn't need mistake because you had br breach of a material provision in the, in the, in the uh, contract that Twitter was by its contract creating express warranties, one of which was a warranty that the SEC filings were accurate. So I didn't really address that adequately, so I want to address that. I would, I think one of the things you could do is try to argue that, first of all, you have to argue that they're in breach because the language is so flexible, as we've mentioned in the SEC filings, that it's like, what are you really warranting? So you could take the position that the warranty is so illusory or so broad as to be a meaningless provision under itself. It's like I'm guaranteeing something with such floaty and 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 vague and unclear language is basically an illusory provision. So that's one idea. If you don't like that idea, another way to get, to get this, and I think you'll hate this idea even more, but I'm going to go there. Another way you could get there is by arguing it's not a material breach. Because if you assume the premise, which I know is assuming a lot, but it's my premise that we went into this whole argument with, right? If you assume the premise that Elon Musk knew of the bot problem, or at least knew that there was a bot problem and accepted the, I accepted the uncertainty of the scope of the bot problem. So if you went to the idea that he went in with that knowledge, then them breaching the warranty is not a material breach because it does not materially impact the nature of the contract from Elon's point of view. If Elon is going into the contract with knowledge that the bot problem is really, really bad, 
or is going into it with knowledge that there is an uncertainty that he is basically accepting, then even if Twitter is in breach of the warranty, it's not a material breach because it doesn't impact the value of the company from from Elon's point of view because he bought it with all that knowledge slash assumption of risk slash uncertainty slash things. So I don't know if any of that answers your question, but that is another idea that it's not, that it might be a breach, but not a material breach because it does nothing to affect the materiality of the contract from Elon's point of view, given the premise that Elon knew all those things. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I thought I'd try. I don't think it's an illusory provision when reporting is mandatory and false statements are punished by law. The, the, the question is, is it illusory with respect to Elon, right? So it's, it, it wouldn't be, the, it wouldn't be an illusory provision. It, it, everything is specific to the nature of the contract and the parties, of course, right? So the provision wouldn't be illusory on itself. The, con the pr provision would be meaningful unto itself. The thing is that Elon, the nature of Elon is changing the nature of what's material. So if it were just random guy on the street or he didn't know these things, then yeah, the representation's material. The question is, is it material to Elon specifically because of Elon's knowledge, assumptions, so forth and so on. So that's the idea. And uh, if you don't agree with that, then uh, we'll just agree to disagree, I guess. But that was my idea. And someone sent me a link. Hold on. Valo docs are up. Sweet. That should be fun for later. Let's see. When Charles Pickney argued that South Carolina would not join the new nation if they could not continue to import, torture, rape, and brutalize other human beings, he was articulating the same philosophy espoused by those who seek to destroy the administrative state? Wow. That's uh, one hell of an argument. Holy shit. That's one hell of an argument. They provide them with false info in the engagement period. It's a problem. Hmm. Not if he didn't believe the false information or not if he had, I, you know, I, I just, you know, I think, I think there's an argument there, but I get, I don't know. I don't know. But that's, that's a hell of an argument here. We're getting so distracted off topic. I just wanted to clarify something and I, I wound up making things worse. <laughs> I tried. Uh, let's press on. Um, anyways, uh, the I'm so I'm so confused now. Um, where was I? Oh yes, it's the same philosophy as th those who are espousing the destruction of the Ministry of State. I, I mean, I have long questioned Chevron, and therefore I would seek to seriously undermine the Ministry of State. But apparently. I'm expressing the same philosophy as Slavis. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. Everyone said goodbye to Jerry. The attempt to return to a white supremacist park patriarchal state links desire to dismantle the administrative state with constitutional originalism of the court's new majority. And both like white supremacy and patriarchy dress up a naked grab for power in the rhetoric of principle and legal logic. What the hell are you talking to? I mean, what the hell is that all about? Lord, man. I mean, it's not, it's nothing about, it's, it's principled. I can't, you know, I anyway. Originalism is not simply a neutral traditional philosophy. Yes, it is. When weaponized, 
as it has by the Supreme Court, is transformed into a political tactic and a serious sounding way to embrace white supremacist patriarchal narrow thinking of political rights exercised by many Americans. Well, that was a whole lot of stupid. That was an incredible amount of stupid. That was an incredible amount of stupid. So, yeah. Five dollars from Ricardo Ospinia. Prediction somehow this article thinks Clarence Thomas supports white first supremacy. You'd be right. Stacy Haworth becomes a member for two months. Joanne Hutchinson is a member for three months. And John O'Brien super chat, which led to a whole discussion. So yeah. So all that good stuff. Well, I think I am done with all my bar prep for the day. I may or may not do additional streaming today. There, I, I might do a, I, do, I might do a short today. They, the YouTubes seem to like that, and I might try to get into this Laura Vallow stuff, depending on energy and stuff. But yeah, but I appreciate everyone was here, who's here, and I appreciate everyone who helps to support the channel. If you like the channel, please remember to do the like, comment, subscribe, YouTube -y things. I hope this has been interesting, if bit frustrating at times. Um, until later, my friends, I hope all's well. Cheers, my friends, and goodbye.